We should have taken some kind of side bet on the number of attendees. <laughs> We're up to 20. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Where do you see all the attendees? I see participants. <clears throat> yeah, that's oh, it. I, see right at the yeah. Top. I got it. Okay. It looks like the chat is open too, as you pointed out. So uh, Wayne says hi, and we say hi to Wayne. Oh, I see Katie there. Hey, Katie. Thanks for joining. <clears throat> oh, all these people we wish we could see in person. I know that's the sad part about this setup. Yeah. You don't really get the full everyone participating. Right. But at least more people can come. So that's also really nice too. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, there is something nicely egalitarian about Zoom meetings. Um, I, you know, it just except for the you have to have some tech aspect. It's kind of nice. And you want to share the first slide, maybe that has the just to make sure that it's up and running and it has the introduction or at least the nice photo, which I think is Abigail. Is that a picture of Abigail, the computer? I'm not sure. I'll see. Once we see the photo, I'll have a guess. <laughs> oh, it looks like Abigail's hand in a sweater. I bet it is. That's what I thought. <laughs> We'll just give another minute, everyone. Let a few more people join. William says it's not Abigail. <laughs> We're gonna have to give her a bracelet like that so that it can be <laughs> Abigail. <laughs> I know Katie, right? All of us these days. All right, thanks everyone for joining. <clears throat> Taryn, you tell me when you're ready. Are we ready now? We're ready. We're ready. Okay. Hi, everyone. I wish I could see all of you. Um, but it's great to see your names, at least uh, some I recognize and some I don't. Um, so welcome to our webinar on the practical solutions for exploration learning online. It is hosted by Arizona State University's interplanetary initiative. And so we're happy to be able to do this. Happy to bring these group of experts here um, in order to teach us something new and innovative about online learning. Um, I wanted to, I guess, also kind of acknowledge that we, like all of you, were thrown into online education in March, right? I'm sure a lot of you, if I could see you, <laughs> you'd be nodding your head. And it was new for me and probably new for many of you. And it doesn't look like, um, we'll be going back to the classroom in a normal way anytime soon. So online learning is going to be probably happening for many of us in the fall. And so I'm so pleased to have these experts here with us. Um, maybe Taryn, you can flip to the next slide, please. Well, I should introduce myself. Actually, I didn't introduce myself. So for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Evgenia Shkolnik and I'm Associate Professor of Astrophysics at the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And I'm also the associate, an Associate Director at the Interplanetary Initiative and leading exploration learning for the Interplanetary Initiative. So, um, but thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Taryn. And also a big thank you to Taryn, who you can't see. And unfortunately, we should have her picture up here too. Taryn has been helping us organize this entire webinar. So thank you so much, um, Taryn. And here are four speakers. Now, these we have an incredible lineup for you today in the next two hours, because these are people who are experts in many things, including online education in creative and innovative and active ways. And so our hope today <clears throat> was to bring um, some new skills to you guys so you can bring them into your classrooms in the fall. And so first up today, we have Professor Lindy Elkins-Tanton, who is, um, in addition to an online education expert, is also the principal investigator of the NASA Psyche mission. She is also our managing director and co-chair of ASU's Interplanetary Initiative and a co-founder of Beagle Learning. And we'll be hearing from her first. Um, secondly, we'll hear from Turner Bolin, who is the founder and CEO of Beagle Learning, and he'll introduce this fabulous and innovative software that is going to be helping um, me personally and hopefully some of you <laughs> in the fall with our online education. Um, then we have Professor John Harrison, who's a professor at ASU School of Life Sciences, and he'll talk about strategies and teaching principles and methods of physiological research online. Um, and lastly, we have Professor Jake Pinholster, who's the founding director of ASU's Mesa City Center, associate dean of the Enterprise Design and Operations, and associate professor of media design and part of the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts. And he will be telling us about peer contracts and assessments for effective online calibration, right? We need to know how well this is really working. Okay, next slide, please, Taryn. So a few things just to know some home, uh, some practical things for this webinar is we're doing a webinar format so that we can't, unfortunately, we won't be able to see all of you um, um, and you will be by default muted. Um, but please during the Q and A, um, by all means type your questions and I'll do my best to moderate um, and we'll get to as many of your questions as we can. And for best viewing, please switch to fit to window in your upper right hand corner of your video screen if you want to have that. And um, lastly, um, Taryn has hit the record button. So this is being recorded and we promise to send out a link to the recording and any other resources that we compile for you afterwards for participating. So the next two hours will be filled this way and we will leave um, hopefully 10 minutes for Q&A at the end of each of these half hours. So first we'll hear from Lindy Alkins Tanton, then Turner Bolin, then John Harrison, and then Jen Jake Pinholster with a 10 minute after each one. And uh, we won't have time probably at the very end to um, have an open discussion, but we can um, still connect over email and um, in other ways that we're gonna try and connect with you afterwards. Okay. Um, thank you, Taryn. And we're off to Lindy now. Okay, Professor fantastic. Thanks, Evgenia, so much. And let me uh, set up my screen sharing. Um, can you just confirm that you can hear me okay? Uh, okay, let's see. Is that correct or do I need to swap the screen? Good. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, so, um, oh my goodness. Okay, but I'm having a little technical problem, which is that. Sorry, I need to, um, I need to, wow, weird. Okay, wait, okay, I think I've got it. Sorry, technically challenged. Do I need to swap displays now? No, it looks good. Okay, perfect. I think I now have it so that I can change slides. Yes, all right, perfect, here we go. I would like to welcome you all to the class that Evgenia and I taught starting in January of 2020, this January, the hapless January for all of us who are teaching. This is a class that Evgenia and I have taught together. It's an open inquiry course. This is the classroom we teach it in, and I'm going to just pretend, and I hope you all pretend that you are joining us for this course, because I'm gonna walk you through what happened in our spring. And so welcome, January 16th, 2020. Welcome to Interplanetary Initiative 294, Space Sustainability. So this is an open inquiry course um, and the topic of it is space sustainability and all of you welcome to the classroom and this is how the class starts when we teach these classes. This class is going to be different. The big question we want to ask you right away, all of us taking this class together is why are the content and the process that we learn in education not the same as what we need in work and life? 
So in education, we, listen, we learn things like to sit quietly, listen to lectures, and put the information back on exams. And I would just posit to all of you that those are not helpful skills for the rest of your life. In fact, they're more or less antithetical to the skills that you need for the rest of your life. Our educational process was designed for a time when schools were the primary owners of knowledge. But now we're in the information age and we live in this ocean of information. And so what we try to teach in this class are the tools to find good information and how to identify and solve problems. We're trying to teach you the process skills that you need for work in life. And so get ready because this class is different. So we are no longer in the world of memorization and multiple choice tests. We are actually practicing for real life. That's the purpose of this class. And this is exactly how we started our class in January. So imagine that you had a problem that you wanted to solve in your life or a question that you had, a big question. So set a big goal. This is how we start. In this class, our goal is how can we maximize sustainability in space, transport, and habitation? If we are really going to become an interplanetary species, how do we maximize sustainability? What does it mean to be sustainable in space? And how can we transport and how can we inhabit in the most sustainable way? So this is a pretty big goal question. This is what we're going to address through the whole of, the whole of this course this semester. And so we're going to do it in many steps. And this is how these steps work. The first thing we're going to do tonight, all of you are going to do this tonight. You're going to go home and find a piece of content that takes us a little bit closer toward answering this big goal. And we're trying to mimic the way we really solve problems in real life, all of us, all the time. You've got some giant question, you probably go and Google it and you find some piece of content and you read it and it teaches you a little bit or you watch a video, it teaches you a little bit toward your goal. And then what you need to do is ask a next question. And so in this course, we're going to use this open inquiry process that we worked on for years and years um, that goes through this learning cycle. So you're going to find this piece of content, then you're going to come back into class next week and communicate what you've learned. We'll give you um, a format to write a summary about the information that you find, and you're going to come back and share that information with all of your colleagues here in this room. Because starting today, it's not Evgenia and me telling you all the answers. Because surprise, we actually do not know the answers to this. This is one of the beautiful things about teaching like this. All of us together are going to find the information together and forge forward toward a common understanding. So we're all on the same team now. There's no person at the front who knows all the answers and secretly withholds them until you're ready. And so you're going to bring back the information that you found. And all of your colleagues in this classroom are going to bring back the information that they found. We're all going to share it. And then we're going to decide what the next question is we're going to pursue. Now, this idea, a natural next question, is completely critical to this process. And all of you are going to become experts through this semester at asking natural next questions. These are not questions about the content you just learned. They're not a question that you could just Google and get a certain answer. It's the research question that takes you one step closer to the big goal. The idea is this big goal question is so big that we have to approach it in multiple steps. Many little pieces of information are going to add up to this big goal. And those questions are those steps. And so we're going to practice that today. We're going to practice that today. And then periodically through this course, we're going to distill the information that we have so far. So instead of taking a midterm exam, instead of taking a final exam, we do not have exams. Instead, we practice distilling everything we've learned so far and communicating it to each other. And we're going to use graphical formats for this. We're going to have everyone make infographics. We're going to build mind maps. And it turns out that cognitive science shows that if you make a graphical structure of all the knowledge you have gotten so far that's new and connect it explicitly to things you know already, that's how you retain. And as a sidebar, just to like break the fourth wall for a second, we have found over and over again in this course that when the students follow their own natural next learning questions, which are always different than what the knowledgeable instructor would choose, they absolutely retain the information. We see freshmen reading peer reviewed journal articles and then standing up and presenting to the class without looking at their notes because it's from their question. They understand the why of their learning. So this is what we're going to be doing. And so in this first class, I'm not going to skip a bit of the class because we can't actually do it in real time, can we? Um, uh, Evgenia and another of our colleagues had a big discussion with the students about what would sustainability mean and what does it mean to have transport in space and habitation of space. We call that like a content burst. We give a small piece of relevant information to start people on their way. And then we asked everyone, what is your natural next question? What's the question that you're going to use to get one step closer to our big goal? 
And this is what happened. I believe, Evgenia, that's your handwriting, I think. Um, recording all the <laughs> recording all the questions. And so um, we just ask all the students in the class, what's your natural next question? What's the question that would take you one step closer to our big goal? There's no criticism at this stage. Every question is truly the right question for that student. And then we vote on them. And you can see that not every student had a natural next question. That's okay. They will eventually. They were maybe shy the first day. In these classes, we have freshmen through fifth year graduate students and people from many different um, majors and disciplines, and that works really well. So everyone gets a couple of votes and they vote for the questions they're most interested in. You could see here actually that there was a tie between two questions that each got seven and obviously there was a runoff, an extra vote. And the question that was selected was, how can we motivate multiple nations to work together for this goal? And that was the natural next question that we all chose. And so then we are off and running with this course. And, uh, and we went through this and every, we taught the students what is a primary source, what does peer review mean, how do you find a journal article, here's ways you can read a journal article. And in fact, some of the material that we're making um, available for everyone who's, who's come to this course and that Taryn is going to send out a link to is um, actually an infographic that we've made to help people who've never read peer review journal articles try because one of the really key things to learn to be a great question asker and problem solver and independent learner, what Michael Crow would call a master learner, is that you're unafraid to try to read things that are not right in your wheelhouse. Most students come into college and they've only been assigned things that they are literally responsible for every sentence of. The textbook is written exactly for their level. They have to learn every sentence. Every sentence could be on the exam, but that has no relationship to real life. In real life, you go find something it probably has a partial answer to your question in the third page and the rest of it is irrelevant. And we have a lot of students who've never had to find that nugget of information buried in a paper before. So we ask them right away to try. The rule is you'll never understand it all the first try. No one will, even if it's your field. You just have to try and use this structure to try to work your way through and get something out of the paper. And people do, they do, and they come back and they share it and we do the cycle again and we ask another question. And then, Periodically, we stop after I think three question cycles in this semester, we stopped and we did um, a distillation. And this was uh, one of the distillations that the class made together, linking all the things that we've learned so far. And you can see our big goal question. Now we did not tell them to make a map. We didn't tell them how to do this at all. We just said, bring all your information and hook it up together. Everyone brings their own distillation that they made. And then they work together on the whiteboard to combine their distillations. And this is the infographic that we got. And you can see that even after only about three question cycles, people had put together a tremendous amount of information and begun to understand what the landscape was, policy, sustainability in spacecraft, sustainability of humans, sustainable impact on Earth, sustainability in orbit, and a bunch of the different things that need to be learned. So this is going great. And then, guess what? COVID hits, we're going online. And so I know that many of us had that hair-raising experience where suddenly the incredible things we have going on in the classroom don't, can't happen anymore. Suddenly we're on Zoom. Suddenly everyone is traumatized. Suddenly every student has got an intense personal story and so do the instructors about how our lives are being affected. And yet somehow the learning has to go on. And there's a really good reason that I know that we all embrace besides just the fact that the learning should go on. The other part of it is it gives us a way to do something positive and forward looking that is outside of the world of trauma that we're living in. And so we really embrace this. And um, our class is designed to be only meet in person once a week. We meet, what is it, two and a half hours, three hours? I can't remember right now, once a week. And all the students bring in all their content summaries and they share everything they've learned and we do the natural next question process. And we also have a way to improve people's natural next questions after a number of practices when people are beginning to realize some questions are harder to answer than others. We train them in how to start using this rubric called the question productivity index to help improve their questions. That happens once a week. So now we're suddenly Zooming once a week. And um, this is a picture of one of our Zooms on April 2nd. We made a rule that um, there is someone called the jumping jack czar and we, it changes, it's a rotating position in the class and that person decides how often we do jumping jacks and how many jumping jacks we do. Because if we're gonna sit still for three hours on a Zoom, you better be able to get up and do stuff. So this was a picture that I took with everyone's permission during one of our jumping jack breaks. 
And so what happened in this course is that we kept going, doing exactly the same thing that we were doing in person. And this is why I thought it was important to present what Evgenia and I did as one possible model that people might find helpful, because we have actually developed a way to do open inquiry, which is what this is, both online fully, in person fully, and um, synchronous online, where we do meet online once a week and the rest of the time people are, are working independently. And it worked incredibly well. And so suddenly we're using tools online and you'll see some of them, Turner will show some um, coming up that we hadn't been using in the classroom. In the classroom, we've been using the whiteboard and we'd be using pieces of paper. We weren't using any software at all to do this process. But we kept going and the students really kept with it. And I know that you cannot see this very well right now, but this is um, a mind map. I just want you to look at the size of it. On the left hand side, working from left to right, are all the questions and pieces of content in this mind map that we've made up to the point that we went online. And on the right is everything we did after we went online. And you can see that we just kept going. And even though I know you can't read the content of the bits, we came really far into understanding space sustainability and the students were incredibly engaged. And so in May, at the end of the course, this is what the students said. These are quotes from students when we asked them for feedback and when we got our course evaluations. The online format worked really well for this class. And I think that overall, everything went really well. And I just can't imagine like, that was the best kind of words that we could have seen after the crisis that we were all in this spring. And then another student said, even though we're no longer meeting in person, I still feel like my relationships and knowledge are growing. I think as the group continues to meet together, we begin to become more comfortable providing constructive feedback to one another and help each person craft a stronger natural next question. On the flip side, people seem to be more receptive to receiving feedback. I certainly am. Now, this was one of our big goals with this technique that Evgenia and I have really worked on is to help students give and receive critical feedback that actually inspires them to improve their product. Mostly in school, we experience critical feedback as devastating, not as motivating. But in the real world, what you really need to do is be able to give feedback that positively motivates people to improve and to receive feedback that positively motivates you to improve. And the fact that we were able to keep that culture growing online was really exciting to us. And then finally, one student wrote, I really seriously enjoyed my time in this class and thought that it was an incredibly unique experience. I felt I learned so much this semester. And we did not really have any students who were highly critical. All the students were pleased with the class. All the students felt that they were gaining community and learning skills. And so uh, we felt like this um, forced experiment of taking the way we like to teach in person 100% online was a success and something really worth sharing. And so the message that I personally have is that even though here in the world, all of us are in this giant crisis of many different varieties, there's the COVID crisis, there's our extreme attention to Black Lives Matter and how much we care about changing equity. Instead of seeing this as um, a tragedy, uh, I hope that we might even see it as an opportunity right now to do even better in education and in helping people learn. And, and the reason is that it's very hard to change the status quo without a shakeup. And I suspect that everyone who's here with us today is probably already doing so many amazing things with active learning and different kinds of pedagogies. And maybe you also share this kind of feeling that this is our moment to do better. And so just challenging everyone in the world around us to try active learning instead of passive lecture to teach the critical skills that are open, often overlooked like problem solving and a sense of personal agency. I, I mean, my dream is if we could create, if we could educate a society of humans so each have the sense that it's their job to take action to solve things that need to be solved. And that would be my goal as an educator. And then finally, to be flexible to moving between online, in-person or mixed modes because you know, I don't know how many of you know for sure how you're going to be teaching in the fall, um, but I'm betting that for most of us, our expectations right this moment are going to change. We might start uh, online and end up a bit in person. It might go the other way. You know, who knows? It could be, could be online synchronous or online asynchronous. And so finally, my last slide, um, and I hope that you can see this on your screens if it's, if it's big enough on your own screens. This is, a, this is a graphic that really has three columns, just showing that this variety of, of, of open inquiry that Evgenia and I and a bunch of our colleagues now, many colleagues have been doing for a while, 
um, works uh, online asynchronous, and um, that's how uh, I'm going to be teaching in, in this fall, is um, all of my students doing open inquiry are going to be um, online, but not necessarily required to meet in Zoom. Or we can do online synchronous, like Evgenia and I did this spring, where everyone's online, but we meet synchronously one or more times a week, or on ground, the way we've traditionally been teaching this together, um, is face-to-face. -to -face. And so up at the top, you see that question cycle ask a natural next question, find some content, write a summary. That doesn't change depending on the modality. That's the same across the board. But if you're teaching online, the next step is different. You might upload your summaries into Beagle or into a Google folder or a different way that you want to you know, have that capability. You have to have some way for the students to turn in their work. Um, on the ground, we would just have people print them out and bring them on paper. Then the next step is to do what we call working groups if you are working in groups uh, where the students share with each other what they've learned and discuss their questions and give each other feedback on the questions. So that works the same, either you're on Zoom or you're doing it in person. But if it's asynchronous, then that's the one really different thing. That's why our students will just be receiving feedback from the instructors. And then finally, they have to choose the natural next question they're gonna pursue for their next inquiry cycle. And that works the same for all three modalities. And so um, hoping that this is a helpful thing to share just because it does work in all three modalities and you can move between the modalities um, even with very, very little notice. And so it may be a helpful paradigm for people going forward. I would personally love to hear, um, I'm, I'm finished and so we just have a couple minutes I think for questions before we go on um, to the next speaker. But whether it's now or whether it's in the future, I would really welcome hearing from people who either teach using open inquiry and have great ideas that would help me improve what we do um, or want to talk about um, sharing techniques or are interested in learning about more about what we're doing. The whole point of exploration learning, you know, the whole landscape of inquiry and problem-based learning and every kind of active learning that we try to expound through interplanetary initiative that Evgenia is leading the, this part of interplanetary. The point is that we all have great techniques if we can share. Um, it's not that we think we have all the answers and we're just, uh, you know, lecturing about it because that's not what active learning is. And so thanks so much for listening to the story and I really look forward to hearing people's reactions. Great. Thank you so much, Lindy. There was um, someone who had posted, um, Jenny, David, posted a similar, a similar thought to you that we're living in a unique moment when educators have the ability to push our system towards a more effective approach to education. And then she ends with thinking maps, which is very timely, Jenny, because we're going to talk about that shortly. Um, but there are a couple of questions. Way Raleigh says, does this process work as well with online only asynchronous courses as well as face-to-face -face synchronous learning? We sure hope so. You know, we've, we've really, really been working on how to implement this as asynchronous online and um, uh, feeling confident about it, but are rolling it out this fall. And uh, the thing about, and uh, through many years of practicing this in the classroom in many different ways, you know, we keep learning and improving and changing our process. Um, one of the courses that Evgenia and I taught that worked incredibly well was having, um, it was an all undergraduate course and every student in the first two days of the course shows their own big goal question. That was a very scary moment for me because I was sure that I would be like, no, you're gonna choose things that either you can answer them in a week or you can never answer them or they make no sense because of course I have no faith. And the truth is the students asked great questions and not a single one of them had to change their question through the course of the semester and they learned phenomenal amounts of science, which is what this was about. And that's what we're modeling this asynchronous online um, that we're doing this fall. Every student is gonna choose their own big goal question. They're gonna build their own mind map and then we're going to encourage them very strongly, but not require them to have a synchronous Zoom meeting with a working group of about four other students once a week to share and help each other with questions. And so we anticipate this is going to work well, but gosh, it's an experiment. We'll find out. Um, okay, one question. Um, I see Mary has her hand up. I don't know if you can speak. If you... I don't think so. I think you have to put it in questions oh, Mary... or chat. Okay, oh, she wrote it here. With, um, well, first is a question that asks if we're going to put the slides online. Um, we're going to have some resources um, available to you, and um, including a recording of this. And Taryn Struck will send out the link soon after, in a few days, when yeah. we're done. Okay. Um, so, and then Mary asks, um, "Do you have a list 
of questions you can share to help move the students through this process. Yes. Oh my gosh. So um, one of the really, really exciting things we're doing, and so just to make it super clear, like I'm a professor at ASU, I've been practicing this at ASU with Evgenia and other, other colleagues for a while. Simultaneously, quite a few years ago, Turner and I and a couple other people founded Beagle Learning to create the tech platform for this. And so there is a, you know, I kind of have two hats on and like seriously not here to make a hard sell, but just to offer the things we've discovered. And um, one of, and I'm, I'm mentioning this specifically because Beagle Learning is working with us and Mary Lou Fulton Teachers College with um, the public schools in Mesa, Arizona. And I think we probably have some Mesa people on here implementing this um, starting in the high school, but also going to the elementary school and the middle school. So this is gonna be, there's gonna be an open inquiry path in Mesa all the way from kindergarten through the end of high school. And one of the things we've developed for this is a tremendous amount of scaffolding to help teachers and students step their way through this because I've found, having taught for years, once you start teaching this way, it's completely intoxicating. The students get so involved and so eager and so many amazing things you learn that you never knew before, but there's a big step where you have to give up the control of knowing everything in the classroom. And that's scary. So we have got a tremendous amount of scaffolding to help with this process, and we're really happy to help people do it. Thank you so much, Lindy. We're now Thanks at a lot. Um, And thank you everyone for your questions. And there's more questions in the Q&A, and those of us um, who have access to this, our panelists, Please, we can continue answering them um, just via typing and everyone will be able to read them. Um, hopefully everyone can see the answers as well, right? I, I, assume, I assume all our panelists can, or all our, all our attendees also can. All right, so thank you, Lindy. Um, and we're gonna turn it over to Turner Bolin of Beagle Learning. Feel free to share your slides. Hello, everyone. Yep, and is audio working all right? I'm bringing up slides now. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. And your slides look good. All right. Um, hi, everyone. So glad to be here and get to follow that up. Um, my outline for what I want to do in about 20 minutes, and speaking of which, I got to make sure I'm keeping track of time there, um, is to tell you just very briefly sort of why Beagle Learning came to exist uh, and, and what we are uh, so that you have that context. And then spend a little bit of time going through um, how you might start breaking down this big open inquiry idea into parts that are um, configurable for you and some of the major questions that we've run into as we did that and how to fix them. So what's Beagle? What are the steps here? And how can we get through some challenges? Um, so first of all, uh, Beagle Learning, we're a tech startup that's been around for a couple years now, um, supported by ASU, which is awesome and close partnership with ASU. And it's been really fun to do all this work. Um, and also through NSF and a couple of tech accelerators, if you've run into any of them. Um, but the big thing I want to share about Beagle is our purpose statement. Uh, this is something we've been working on recently, which is trying to really concisely say, why do we exist? And what are we trying to accomplish as a company? And so here is our latest phrasing. Uh, Beagle exists to empower individuals to shape their own futures by building an innate passion for discovery, rewarding creativity, and humanizing critical thinking. So for us, this is, this is sort of how we encapsulate what we are trying to achieve. And this inquiry model is one of the best ways we've run into so far to try to achieve these goals in education in particular. Um, and so that's really where we're coming from. And echoing Lindy's sentiments on this, we are so excited at any point in time to hear what everyone else has found works along these lines and how to organize in the classroom and how to help tweak these processes. So uh, this is totally a community endeavor as much as possible. So with that in mind, what you just saw from Lindy was how uh, Lindy and Evgenia has wa have walked through this cycle, uh, which you saw a moment ago. And um, what I wanna do is first emphasize one thing that is really important about this cycle. Any time we're doing open inquiry or inquiry of any kind or exploration learning broadly, I think the one you know, ineffable rule, the one thing that must be true is that the student has to own and love the work they're doing. And if you start with that, if they really care about what they're working on, then a lot of the rest I think can be tweaked uh, for the scenario and the case you're in. 
And so what I'm sort of encouraging everyone to think about is uh, so long as you make sure that students really love the topic and are, are excited about that and are able to own their process forward, you can think of each of these parts as a building block to a class. Um, you can break them up and re maybe not, I don't know how much you can rearrange them, but you can certainly remove parts and add parts or duplicate parts as needed. And so uh, that's how I'd encourage you all to think about this going forward. Um, so with that in mind, what I thought would be the most helpful way to introduce a little bit about what Beagle does to help with this rearrangement, but also um, hopefully provide some thoughts that are helpful for you designing your own class is to go through some questions that I feel need answering if, uh, if you were to just hear, hey, there's this great open inquiry process, now I'm gonna do it online. So I'm gonna step through a couple questions that I think maybe are helpful here. So the first one is um, with so much unstructured time today, as everyone is working and living from home so much of the time and there may not be the structures of friendships and uh, advisors and all these other human contacts during school, uh, how do we keep or help students keep up their momentum? How do we do that? And so one solution that we work on is what Lindy just mentioned actually the, during the Q&A and that's scaffolding. And so I wanted to show you visually how we think about scaffolding or setting up step-by-step -step, uh, run-throughs of parts of this inquiry cycle in a classroom. So first we would start by looking at a specific piece, in this case, the step of finding information. And um, what we try to do is we try to break that up uh, in the online environment, especially into a set of steps that can be um, easily understood and adopted by people when they've encountered this for the first time. And so you don't have to use all of this. If your students you know, have these you know, confidence in this, you don't have to use any of this, but for some people I think this would be helpful. So for the find information step, we would think about breaking that down into three steps. Uh, note, or excuse me, at the top, choose a source, just anything. Choose something out there that may help you with your big goal question. And the second step is to read until something feels important. And then finally, just to grab that thing that's important as you go and use this as a tool for identifying key information as you go. And like I said, this is probably more important and helpful with younger age groups, and there's other structures that work better with older age groups. So with that in mind, um, I wanted to show how we scaffold that in the Beagle software in particular, and I am not saying that this is the only way to do this kind of scaffolding online. I think you can do this through Canvas and other tools as well, but uh, this is one example. Um, and so in the Beagle system in particular, what we do is we break this down into a screen where first, uh, students are just choosing a resource. All they have to do is find one resource they want. And then we step them step by step once they've done that through to a second step of actually being able to do any of their note taking and live annotation in a single online software system. So that's the second step annotation where they can go through this text and highlight what's important and make notes. Again, some students don't need this, some students don't necessarily want to do it here, but our point is to give a structure to help keep people focused through the process. Um, so they can highlight from that, uh, make a note of what's really valuable about that specific piece of information to their goal question. And once they're done with that, uh, you, you leave this part of the flow with uh, essentially a set of annotations of what's really valuable. And one thing that we found that works really well here is to invite students that as soon as you hit something you don't understand, it is totally fine to stop and just ask a question. And that can be a really helpful tool here as well uh, to prompt those conversations around uh, what else needs to be included in the learning process. So um, I'm gonna skip the other, the other workflows here. I just wanted to give you a sense of how the scaffolding goes. But what I do wanna highlight is how we break down the workflow for each one of these. So we're not gonna show the software, but if you're thinking about reflection and summarizing, so how we actually summarize what we learned, we often break that down into this idea of reviewing everything you pulled out of this, prioritizing the most important information to share, and then expanding on why that's relevant to your goal question. So it's sort of a three-step process, one three-step process that can be used for um, summarizing. So I'm gonna skip a bit here. Um, but uh, so that, to sum up that step, main idea is scaffolding as a tool to help people keep, keep people focused uh, going in these really unstructured environments. Second question that I've 
been running into and thinking about is how do you manage big group decisions if you want this to be a collaborative process? How do you do that in an online environment? And what can we do to support that? And so again, I'm just gonna show the Beagle solution to this, but there's plenty of other tools out there to do this. Um, and so what we do is we just do a big voting round in a digital platform. So we invite everyone to post the questions that they have in an assignment on a digital platform, on the Beagle platform. And this is an example from an intro to economics class. And once each student is posting the questions that they're really excited about pursuing, if you wanna choose as a group rather than individual, uh, you just upvote the most popular question and then that one can be selected. So this is the digital equivalent of what Lindy showed in her slides in her first presentation. So that was question two. The third thing that we've been thinking about a bunch is if we can now scaffold the structure and get people to walk through doing the research steps and if we can make those group decisions then how do we actually track and share all the work that's been happening over time with groups and i think this is one of the really key parts or we like to believe one of the key parts that that works really well in this kind of open inquiry exploration learning system and that is uh as lindy hinted at mapping out the process um, so what we do in the online version of beagle is we build this map mind map automatically as students go through the process. And I think the key idea here, uh, the, there's sort of two key ideas to take away from this. One is that visual mapping can be a tool that you use in person or online, sort of in any environment to help students see the progress they're making and like own that and see that that's something that they're doing that's really exciting, that's moving their own knowledge forward and then reflect, be a metacognitive about um, what has been helpful in their process and what hasn't. So using this as a visual tool. And then the second thing that I think is really important here is making this available to groups of students working together. Um, I don't know, I would actually be lo love to hear this from other people. One of the things I've struggled with with Canvas is I don't know of good ways to have graded work that is for credit and also is uh, shared and worked on and iterated on by a group. And so I think that's the other thing that I think is really important to enable here is to have groups working together on a product and make that actually part of the experience so we're not in a world where you're told if you're right and wrong by a teacher at every step of the way but instead you as a group are finding and building knowledge together um i was going to show a bigger example but lindy beat me to it so uh, i'll here you can come back to these slides if you want and and take a look at this but this is just a bigger example map uh, to see how these grow over time uh, this would be an intermediate stage between the one I just showed and the one Lindy showed. And then the fourth kind of key question I want to highlight here as potentially an idea or a tool for everyone to take away and put into your own work is how can we provide feedback, coaching, and assessment for a structure like this? So we're moving away from the world where we know that people are learning specific content. And I know that Jake's going to talk about this more, so mine's just going to be one brief part, part about this. But uh, there is this big question of if we're moving away from prescriptive content up front, what do we do for feedback and assessment and how does that fit into the process? And so I wanted to share one specific tool that we've been developing over the past couple of years. Um, Lindy and Evgenia have both put a ton of work into this as well. And that is this question productivity index that Lindy highlighted earlier. So the question productivity index for us is a way of measuring the value of a question to get you to an end goal because question asking is a skill. And uh, it's true that every question that you come up with is valuable for the reason you brought it up with. Some are better for getting you to a goal than others. And so if we can train this skill and help people assess themselves on this skill, that's a big value. And so here's how we think about it. You have some starting point in your knowledge of the world, and then you have this big goal that you've set. So for example, with the class we were talking about earlier, that is how do we, uh, was it maximize the phrasing you used? How do we maximize sustainability as we inhabit space? I'm not getting the wording exactly right there. So that's your goal. And this arrow here is uh, how, uh, is, is a representation of a question and how that question brings you from the start toward the goal. And so the first way we might look at that is we might look at what we would call the articulation of that question. How clear is this? And one way to represent this is do different people in the class or in the conversation or in the project have a different idea of what it means? Or do we all really understand where we're trying to get? And so we sort of measure that as like the range of those interpretations. 
So a really clear, specific question is gonna help us move together better as a group. And then the second thing we can look at is value. And we kind of think of that as like the angle between the direction your arrow is taking you and the direction to your goal. And the closer you are to that line, the higher value this is, the better uh, your work on this question is gonna move you forward. And then the third component would be scale. So from the starting point to where this question is gonna bring you, how big a step is that? And you can ask oftentimes very small questions about specific pieces of information that are vital, but they may only take you five minutes to Google and they may not move you forward that far. And so oftentimes when we're thinking about questions, we're trying to identify middle range scale that'll take a big chunk of work, but is manageable and can move you a significant step towards your goal. So for the QPI, I, uh, we've included a rubric built off of this in the resources that you'll have access to. Um, and so if this is something that you see as valuable, I would totally encourage you to take it and use it as you see fit. We often use this as a self-assessment or a peer assessment tool that's formative rather than summative. So instead of saying you are a three on question asking ability, the point of this is to say that this specific question that you're thinking about right now is a three and are there ways you might wanna you know, change the scale or change the way you're saying it to make it better. So that was it. Those are my four big questions that I came up with that I've been sort of wrestling with as we bring this online and a couple bits of the Beagle platform that help to solve this. Um, and I wanted to kind of sum this up by saying the ways that I, and by extension, I guess the whole Beagle team are, are trying to help with this kind of learning is that we wanna help people figure out how to plan effective classes for this because that's always a challenge in different environments and depending on the cases you're in. We really wanna help with scaffolding for students because there's a balancing act to be done here. Uh, if you scaffold too much, it feels like you're talking down to someone, right? It feels like you're saying, take this little step, then this little step, then this little step, and you lose sight of why we're doing all this work, and you lose the motivation. And if you scaffold too little, then people don't know how to take the step. So there is, I think, a balance here to be struck with how you scaffold. And then the third thing we really want to try to help with is the software to make this a simple process to run both online and as classes scale up. So with that in mind, I wanted to put out a sort of uh, a invite or a uh, offer to everyone, which is that if any of these things that we just went through seem valuable or seem like they might be helpful to expand on for your class, um, we've made a little form. And if you wanna go on this site, uh, I'll send this, I'll make sure this is included later as well. You can just sign up and um, we'll make sure that someone or a couple people from the Beagle team are available just to do 30 minute working sessions and help you think through any component of your own class that's helpful. And uh, this is the first thing that came to mind for me that I think we can offer and be really helpful for with classwork. And so I hope that if this is helpful to you, you'll take advantage. Um, and also of course, feel free to reach out for any other reason. Um, with that, uh, thanks so much for listening and being here and thinking about changing education. Um, I'd love to take some questions on this and, and we can revisit anything that is helpful. So thank you very much. Thank you, Turner. That's really helpful that you've made that available. I really appreciate that. And hopefully people will take you up on that offer. Totally so, hopeful we'll have a chance to do it, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think any of us would probably be really happy to have any conversations about any of this. and. Um, there's different ways to do it with different kinds of platforms or with no platforms. And it's, that's, you know, the whole goal is just to improve the education. So whatever it is that we can do to help. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, and I see Carolyn Bickers, who's also of the Beagle learning team has posted um, that particular website in the chat. So you can just copy oh. it straight away. Thank you, Carolyn. Um. Okay, there's a question from Cody. In your experience, what type of class is this open inquiry structure most suitable and adaptable for? Okay, I'm gonna give you the, um, the, the I guess, the, the standard answer and the extreme answer. <laughs> and so the standard answer, uh, the maybe more sort of realistic and, uh, answer here is that I think it is, it is most applicable when uh, you have a, a class that has uh, 
shall we say, less strictly required specific pieces of content and more an overarching learning goal. So I think if you're trying to do a survey class where you have 50 specific ideas that someone needs to learn to sort of get the content that service class, that may be difficult. But if you're in an environment where you're trying to introduce someone to a subject area, you're trying to get them to practice doing experimentation or research in a specific field, you're trying to get them to think really deeply about a piece of art or theater or to create some new piece of art, I think all of those are places where uh, open inquiry can work really well. Um, so that would be one sort of way to think about where is this going to fit best. The more extreme answer is I think I really honestly believe, deeply believe that this is totally applicable absolutely everywhere in education. And I know people will tell me that's not true and that's crazy, but I think there's something here, a rude idea here, which is that people learn best when they know why they're learning the content in front of you, them. And so at the very least, if you make sure that the content is being taught in response to a question and you let students guide a little bit what content comes when, I think even in the case of very content heavy classes, there is a lot of value in incorporating this set of ideas. I will, if you don't mind, add also that I've tried a hybrid model in the past where, um, where I felt that it was, it was a graduate level course in my field, which is in exoplanets, and I wanted the students to have certain things that they would get some content, I guess, or things that they should have known by the end of the class, but we did it in an inquiry way that was only mildly guided if they were not getting the content. So there were things that I felt that I, but I didn't really have to, like they were still getting what I thought they should get out of it just by asking the questions and reading the literature and answering them because they're getting content by doing all the, all the papers that they're reading. They're, they are absorbing real content that they actually need. So I actually did not have to, um, control things in any real way, even though I was very aware of this issue of will they get all the content, right? All this, this concern that many people have, it really didn't bear out to be true, as you say. And, and I think in the end, they did learn a lot more and they retained a lot more. And they probably know it now, years later, much better. Yeah, to, just to add to that, I think that um, you can also just add one or two question cycles, like a little unit of open inquiry to something where you're otherwise have to hit certain standards or whatever are your constraints. Mm -hmm. And that way, give the students a sense that they themselves can find out what the whole landscape is and they don't have to depend upon you for everything. That's true too. I'm gonna throw one last thought on this, this pile here, which is another resource that I think you should all have access to after this is um, a little document that someone in this group, uh, Judy, who's I don't think on the call right now, um, she put together around process plans. How do you plan out a course to do this and what are sort of the steps you need to think about? And that might be worth looking at if you're thinking about this question too, because it highlights sort of how you can scale up and down the amount of time you're putting into inquiry and how you can scale up and down the complexity of it and the freedom of it. So I think that's, that's another way to think about um, doing this. Yeah, if I just add one more thing. We, we, we've started calling them process plans instead of, you know, what are they called? Lesson plans, because what we're trying to teach is the process and not necessarily prescribe the content. Um, and so what you've seen so far, and now you're about to see two more amazing talks about other ways to teach, but we're trying to just show a way to do open inquiry that works in person and online so that it's flexible. But there are so many different varieties of open inquiry. And I would just love it if anybody who's on this um, webinar, just put a little comment in the chat. If you've used open inquiry, just one little statement about what you've done with it. I'd be so interested to learn. I feel like I could learn so much from everybody here. And while we wait for anyone who wants to share in the chat, feel free to do jumping jacks. It's about that time. Um, and those of you, the attendees, you don't have your video on, so there's really nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> I could really use some myself, I have to admit. <laughs> They've all been doing jumping jacks the whole time. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Okay, well, if no one is uh, chatting right now, please feel free to keep the conversation going here or in the Q&A. It's, um, it's been really fun to keep up with what everything people have been saying. Um, and we will move on to John, John Harrison, over to you. Can I, I put it, this in the chat, Turner, but um, I think you didn't see it. Is Beagle available through Canvas? Is it linked yeah, to I was, that? I was about to. 
Yeah, so I was about to reply to you directly, but it's great to bring this up for everyone. Um, am I still, I think I had a little lag there, but um, yes, yeah, so can't, so if you're at ASU in particular or also Mesa Public Schools in Arizona, um, we are directly embedded in Canvas. And so uh, as we look at other, if you're elsewhere and you have a different learning management system or you're not within those communities, um, we absolutely can embed uh, in pretty much any learning management system just so it's accessible where you expect. Thank you. All right. Okay. Let's see if I can share my screen properly. Can you all uh, see that and hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, but it, wait a minute. Oh yeah, it is advancing. Okay. So, um, this is interplanetary physiology research. The, um, I, know, I know that you, most of you aren't physiologists, but um, I hope that some of the, uh, the things that we've learned along the way, trying to teach um, animal physiology online will ring a few bells for, for some of you. Um, and I think you're all gonna see that we're thinking about uh, a lot of the same things. So this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to start by just telling you the history of the development of this online animal physiology lab that's going to be the main topic. Um, I'm going to go through the learning objectives that we developed for this class because I think this is a really important part of if you're going to think about transitioning from an in-person to um, an online class or a mixed online class. I'm gonna tell you about the three components of the online class that we developed. Uh, we did both um, partnered with a, a Google Labster to uh, develop simulations. We've put in a sort of self-built Arduino-based data acquisition system that the students do their own work at home with. And then we have them, our, our um, version of Kind of what was just talking talked about here is they work in groups to develop a NIH or NSF style uh, research proposal. And, um, and then I'm going to kind of finish by talking about ways I try to get students to communicate and be engaged in the class. So on the right here is the canvas page for this um, this animal physiology lab, which I'm actually teaching right now. It just started. Uh, and um, you know, we this came this came about um, in 2017. Souls decided to produce what was at the time the first online uh, biology major. And of course, labs, as as in uh, many other sciences, labs are really a key component, and it's really where we try to teach practical skills and how to do science. And so it was always, I think, been viewed as a as a real problem for moving to online learning. And um, what, what happened was that faculty were given release time and TA support to develop materials. And I, I created both a lecture class, it's Animal Physiology Bio 360, and, and the lab class, five credits in total between the two of them. And these are kind of, they have both um, the O and I course components. Um, They've been taught four times now to more than 500 students. So they're at least haven't crashed. Now I should say these are these on, totally online classes. They're, um, of course, we're required to do it asynchronously, um, but I'll talk a little bit about how I might do it differently if we could, could do synchronous things. So this class, um, for many years, uh, it's been running as an in-person lab, and this is uh, your classic um, phys animal physiology lab using live animals. Um, students learn to anesthetize and do surgeries on, on animals. And um, obviously, for practical and ethical reasons, these are things they can't do at home. So um, we kind of had to well, I should say, even uh, within the context of these very specific things, uh, I think there were other things that we were really trying to teach in the class. We were trying to really teach them to understand and use physiological instrumentation. We were really trying to teach them about how to do data analysis and graphing and statistics. 
how to read the primary literature and how to interpret their data and do some scientific writing. So there was a, they were really, they, they do, they, this, the in-person class still is running and, I, and it's a um, very immersive, uh, they're, they're really doing science kind of lab. Um, but we kind of had to step back and say, well, we're not really, you know, maybe the goal is not to learn how to do uh, to do surgery on a rat and be able to find the, um, the carotid artery, you know, so we tried to step back and say there are some learning objectives, general learning objectives that we're really trying to go for that could be applied to the online situation. So we, we thought that really one of the key things was to learn how to use instrumentation. We really want them to, you know, most of our students have you know, haven't stuck wires together and built any, any kind of instruments or learned how to calibrate things. We really wanted them to, to do that. We think that's really critical. Um, we wanted them to collect some of their own data and be able to collect and you know, analyze that and think about that. Um, we want them to understand a, a range of physiological techniques. You know, you read a textbook and there's just sort of numbers there. We're really interested in students knowing where those numbers came from. How, how do you actually get them? And most students really have honestly no idea coming in. The textbooks generally don't cover it incredibly well. Um, and we want them to be able to learn to really read the primary literature and evaluate it and synthesize and develop questions, logical next, next questions. And we would call it develop hypotheses and experiments to test those hypotheses. So for the simulations, we worked with a company called Labster, which is owned by Google. And uh, we wrote scripts for 10, 10 labs and they developed the animations. And these are now all commercially available. So the ASU students uh, buy these directly from Labster and many people at other universities are also using them. And um, it's, I think been quite successful. Quite a few of the biology labs are being taught this way now. And, you know, if you're, you know, this is kind of, we're talking about near-term practical solutions. That took a long time it, uh, to do all that. Uh, but I would say there are a lot of simulation labs out there now. And um, I think what, you know, what's often possible if you're really trying to think about run, running some sort of labs in the in the near term, you might be able to look at them, find useful things, but do what you do what you want to do to make it fit your learning objectives better. So even with the fact that we wrote our own scripts and they developed these animations for them, I'm still not 100% happy with the animations they did. And there's really not enough background material for them to necessarily be able to understand what we want them to understand. So you know, within Canvas, we write introductory material and we do pre and post lab quizzes to kind of focus students on what we think matters. And I think that's, that's a, um, you know, a reasonable solution that people might be able to do um, in a short term. So about a third of the course points come from those simulations. Another third comes from these uh, experiments that the students do at home. And I don't know how many of you guys know about these. They're, you know, used in a fair number of, of um, K through 12 schools. So maybe you are, but Arduino and Raspberry Pi are two. There's others that are these basically um, my, tiny little microprocessors that you can buy for as little as $12. And you can hook these up to the USB on your computer. And then all you need is some sort of sensor. And there's a million kind of sensors out there. You can collect all different kinds of data. The, Programs are, in many cases, just available online, and they're not that hard to learn how to edit them if students need to alter those um, programs to make them useful for them. They can capture data from those sensors in real time and put it on the screen, or you can download the data to Excel. So we thought these were a really good way to be able to give the students something they could really learn some practical computerized data acquisition stuff and do some experiments at home. So we have them do one student project that they do individually. They uh, buy an Arduino, they buy a little system that will record electromyographs. So these 
They basically can stick an electrode on you know, any muscle of their body, contract that muscle and see the amount of activation, the amount of electrical signal. And um, there's a, a lot of different things they can do with it. Um, we have three assignments that they do. And I should say one thing about the online classes, they happen in six or seven weeks. So it's kind of a blitzkrieg. If you had 13 weeks, you could spread this out a little bit and maybe do some more, um, more steps. But we kind of have one, one thing where they basically demonstrate they have the system working. And we spend a lot of time uh, helping them troubleshoot to get them working. Um, then they write a research proposal. And that's basically, um, you know, we're trying to get them to think about what kind of things could they measure on themselves or their friends with COVID. It's, you know, themselves or their family or their dog. Uh, and um, the, um, to help that, we give them examples um, from previous semesters. And we really try to um, do, use office hours and get them to contact us with their, with their questions and ideas and develop the ideas. They submit a proposal, the TAs give them written feedback, and then two weeks later, they submit um, a, a regular report with, all, with their data analyzed and interpreted. So I think it, it's a really cool project. A lot of the students, some of them have terrible headaches, but 99% of them finally get it, and they, uh, they really do collect some cool data. And then the last third of the class is, um, they basically, as a group, they work in groups on Canvas uh, to write essentially an NIH or NSF style uh, research proposal. And uh, the way we do this is um, the first week, they have to um, form a group. So this is this where you guys were talking a little bit. How do you do these asynchronous um, group work? And uh, what I've been doing is listing uh, meeting times by day and, and you know, Monday afternoon. Friday evening and have the students pick a time that they are available. And, um, and then, um, and I do allow some them to do individually because I do get some students that have really crazy schedules and can't seem to find a way to work with others. But I really encourage them to work in groups. Um, we give them quite a bit of training and group organization in the sense that we, uh, they have to write a group charter and they talk about um, when they're gonna meet, how, you know, how often they're going to meet on Zoom, how they're going to make decisions. I loved your um, voting. That's why I was asking about the beagle ways to kind of get students to uh, talk about, you know, vote up particular ideas. But, you know, I get, I ask them to at least think about how they're going to make those decisions. And then I think a key part is I do give them a list of topics that I know there's some, they could find papers on and that there's a, a lot that isn't known about. So I just listed three out of 25 or something that I give them, you know, uh, what are some good and bad things about CBD? That one always fills up, you know, how can some frogs free solid and survive? Why do we age? You know, just really fundamental kind of biomedical questions that there's um, actually a lot of interesting literature and, you know, fascinatingly, we of course don't understand any of these. Um, and uh, so they basically turn in an assignment where they list their references and what they're thinking about as a topic. We give them feedback on that. Again, we uh, have e either the instructor or the TAs participate in the Zoom groups to talk about how helping, helping them develop the particular ideas. So it's not as beautifully developed as your, as your cycle, I don't think. I think I could improve the class that way in terms of helping them think about how to move to the best next question, but that's basically what we get to try to have them try to do, identify what isn't known and what experiments can you do to answer, you know, push the, push the barriers of physiology knowledge forward. Um, we do provide um, good examples again, and we try to have a really clear rubric, and we try to do iterative meetings, you know, getting the students to meet at least weekly by Zoom to discuss all this. And they, submit a draft proposal that they get feedback on, and then they submit a final proposal. And this is just a kind of another thing that we do related to this. I, if you've taught on Canvas, you know, there's module zero with a syllabus quiz, and then you get into module one and two with all the sort of weekly material. And so we've put in a module 0 0.5, likely helpful items. And in there, we've got 
you know, we sort of have training on how to do groups, how to do Zoom in groups, how to use Excel to make graphs, how to do stats in Excel. And for the proposals, they do a budget. Uh, and if they're going to use animals, they have to do an animal permission request and we give them forms and instructions on how to do things like that. And then kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, student communication and engagement. Um, I don't know how many of you have used Yellowtig. It's a social media platform embedded within Canvas and I've become a real believer. Um, I give 7% of the class points. Uh, I mean, 7% of the total points in the class are given participating in Yellow Dig. They do six posts and I get 30 points. And I start by asking them to introduce themselves and say why they're taking the class and, you know, tell, tell, me, tell them everyone about themselves. And I find that to be really great for me knowing more about the students and the students starting, you know, to talk to each other about things. I've just got three little quotes. I mean, there's always a bunch of Starbucks students. I've had students from Kazakhstan you know, I'd swear my average student is a vet, has two kids and works full time. So, you know, we're definitely with online, we are getting, you know, different students who would have a hard time being in our classrooms. Um, and it monitoring and responding to this, um, you know, takes a lot of time. Well, I, I guess I didn't say the other big thing I wanted to do is just post questions about the class and answer other students questions. And it's really a great way, I think, to find out what they're confused about or what, what I goofed up in than my syllabus or something like that. And, and, um, and also just the students to help themselves and feel engaged. So I'm, I, I really like it. And that's all I've got. Wow, thank you so much. That's good to hear that there's such a variety of online students taking these courses. Yeah. Um, I invite the attendees to please type your questions into the Q&A. Um, and I know there's been some chatter that I've not been able to keep up with. So if anyone there wants to bring something to a broader discussion, by all means. But I do have a question for you, John, because taking labs online seems like generally, it, you know, people are worried about it who haven't done it before. What would be your best advice for people who are a little nervous about it? I mean, I should we think, be? Maybe, maybe we shouldn't be. Maybe. I, I, maybe I mean, I, to me, there are certainly some subjects you, you won't be able to do exactly the same thing. I mean, ASU is kind of requiring us to give it the same number and say it's the same class. And that's really not true when you compare the in-person class and, and what I'm doing. But I do think that um, there are some things that we're doing better. It certainly falls in the same general purview. And that there's some things we're doing better than the in-person class does. So mm -hmm. I think you have to really think about what it is you're trying to teach. I think going back to the learning objectives, um, you know, and I'm sure that it can't work for every class. I mean, I, you know, at some point, you know, you want students to learn how to pipette if they're going to be a chemist uh, or, you know, a molecular biologist. And so, you know, I don't think we should give all that up. You know, and you can actually in Labster, they have, you know, you grab a pipetter in some of these labs and they're, but it's not the same, you know, they, they, they should actually get the practical hands on experience. I do think we have to have ways for them to do that as well. Okay. But on the other hand, for other types of work, it's probably not so critical. They probably don't necessarily need to have that hands on experience. And again, I think a lot of what we do is computer related in data acquisition kind of things in physiology that you really, like I said, I really think the Arduino stuff is in some ways they're more in charge of it and learn more practical things than they would when we give them our $100,000 force transducers that they have to be really careful with. Okay, thank you. I know Lindy had a couple of questions for you. Um, Lenny, do you want to ask that? And yeah, we'll... for sure. Sorry, I'm, it feels kind of silly to be taking up the time, but I have two really genuine questions for you. I just step off for a second and I missed how your students get their Arduinos and their hardware that they need. And then the second question, if I just ask you at the same moment and then mute again, is um, one of the concerns I've had about Yellowdig um, is that by requiring people to post for points that you might not be getting necessarily really genuine comments that are heartfelt learning questions, but things that are just there to kind of fulfill the points. And I wonder, 
I suspect that you've really worked on this. It seems like this is such a cool class. I wonder if you have points on how to make that work better. I think that um, for, on the first one, we basically, um, I email everybody in the class a couple weeks to head the mailing list. They, they buy it from Amazon or Adafruit or where, wherever. I give them four or five different places that they can buy each thing. So we looked into, I mean, in an ideal world, we would probably purchase them all ahead and ship them out, you know, and it would be part of a lab fee, but the lab fees have always been, it's always changing what happens. As a matter of fact, they've taken away our ability to do lab fees. And so that's partly why we went this route. Um, and it does make you more flexible in the long run. And so actually the itsy bitsy board that we started with, they're kind of phasing that out. So we've had to test out some new boards and you know, in a way it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in terms of yellow dig, I think to me, the key is I'm on it like almost every day responding to students. So, you know, I think they're honest. I just don't really see much. I mean, occasionally, like there's a, a few students who the last day will of the class will make six posts that are, you know, here's a cool thing I found, you know, they're obviously just throwing things up. But the vast majority of them are really doing, you know, asking good questions. And I, and I know it. I know who they are if they're doing that. And it's really pretty rare. I think as long as they get the feeling you're on there, you know, responding and listening to them, that they'll not do that. Right. And the chat is also providing some similar answers to that question. Um, I did have a question for you about something earlier that you said, John, about how there's some things that are better in your online lab than are in person. Can you elaborate on what those things are? Well, our classic labs are more formulaic. I mean, you know, when you're, you know, when you've got a rat, an anesthetized rat, you've got a vet, we have a vet tech in there to help us make sure that everything is going well. But, you know, it, it limits to some extent what you can do. Um, and then the write-ups that they do, um, at least traditionally, um, you know, they're just not at anywhere the same depth, I guess. So instead of doing, you know, seven or eight write-ups on slightly more formulaic labs, you know, I think the research proposal, for example, is, is super open-ended mm -hmm. and really requires them to be more, well, puts them more in charge of it. It makes, you know, they... Um, so I, and, and you know, it's, right, it's a longer, more synthetic document, you know? So I think that's one thing. Um, and like I said, I think building the Arduino, um, that, that's a really good, everyone has to do it. And then I guess the last thing in the terms of the simulations, uh, just as an example, you know, you can do things that there's no way you could do in a real student lab. So just to talk about two of them, um, you know, I do a lab, I have a simulation on how to weddle seals dive underwater for 30 minutes. You know, so the students get an airplane, they fly to Antarctica, they catch a weddle seal, they cut a hole in the ice, the seal goes down, they put a dome over it so they can measure its oxygen consumption, you know, when it comes up and exhales, they have a little pack on it so they can get blood lactate levels and blood PO2 levels. And then they get the data and they have to think about it. That would be tough to do, and you know, in a in a, a ASU three hour lab, um, you know, we have another one where they do they patch clamp um, pain sensors and look at what channels are involved in sensing pain in a rat. And again, that's just, you know, it takes it takes you about six months to learn to be able to do that prep. Honestly, I I, I tried and never and, and failed, you know, as a postdoc. And it's you know, so you can do things that are technically harder. But you know, big important um, mm. technique. So the, you know, in some ways, we can do more modern and and more exciting techniques than we can do in a student lab, like an in-person lab. That's a really excellent point. I really thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, thanks That's for inviting great. me. Making me think. It makes me think about the astronomy online course I was developing last year and how much what we can take back to the traditional classroom from that. Mm -hmm. Um, excellent. Um, any more questions for, uh, for John from the panelists or the attendees? I, I just have to say that was, I'm really glad that you came and presented. I've learned a ton because we've been hearing at ASU a lot about this major and not really understanding what was going on under the hood. So I feel like you should give this talk to everybody. Thank you.
yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah. From looking at the chat, it looks like you should give it at Michigan too. Hmm. <laughs> well, it's online, so anyone in Michigan can register. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, the talk, yes, but also the course. Anyone wants to take the course and take the course anywhere. Mm -hmm. That's fabulous. Right, that's one of the things, as you had pointed out earlier, John, that I really appreciate about online learning is the egalitarian aspect of it is, um, is inspiring and really makes you think mm -hmm. about um, the limits, uh, the things that limit people from getting to the classroom in the first place. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. I've got somebody on an aircraft carrier in the Navy right now. I right. have to say that that is, that is huge. And if we're thinking about um, social justice and education mm -hmm. right now, making these things available to the largest number of people, people who have to be working people home with their kids, you know, people who can't necessarily culturally travel away from where they're living with their families. You know, those things are really, really important. And we've been experimenting with um, remote teams for capstone projects. And we had a remote team um, that actually won a capstone competition where uh, one of the members was on a submarine and, and then other people were all up and down the East Coast and they were mailing hardware back and forth to each other. And so uh, I never even had imagined that something like that could happen. And so looking yeah. what you're doing too, I think this really is a step for equity. Okay. Well, um, I had to mute myself because of screaming outside the door. Uh, so speaking of opportunities that I can be here with you over Zoom, while well, not being able to leave my children. Um, so this is great, works for me too. Um, okay, if there's nothing else for John, we will move on to Jake. Um, it's your, you're up next. Great, thank you. Let me uh, share my screen here. Okay, so I'm in this unique position, well not unique, but rare position in the academy of, I've spent the last 13 years um, not teaching in a subject area so much, but rather teaching collaborative practice across multiple different disciplines and areas. And uh, it's, it, it's led me to a place where I'm very much echoing and adding to uh, Lindy's very passionate statements at the beginning of this whole thing about the that the nature of our education system right now is not really doing a fantastic job of preparing students for what they're going to need going forward. And one of the areas where I feel like that's that shortfall is the, is the worst is in the area of collaboration uh, in, in general, but online in particular. Um, students uh, in our education system have learned again and again and again to hate and fear and dread group projects um, with very rare exceptions. Uh, and this is, again, I think it's connected to the, to the same issues that are related to inquiry in that we've defined so narrowly the nature of what is considered education and what a student must go get out of it, that there's often not the, the latitude to explore or to enable group agency. Uh, so I, for the past 13 years, have been teaching uh, a series of classes, and during most of those classes, I've actually conducted surveys about student attitudes towards group um, projects and in, in general. And I find that my very first semester uh, before I started doing this online, I walked into the class of 150 students in a first year experience seminar that was about breaking them from some of their habits picked up through what is most of K through 12 education available in this country. And I asked how many of you hate group projects and literally every single person in the class raised their hands. It wasn't, it was greater than 96% in that one. Every single person, some of that's peer pressure. Uh, that there is just an, an unbelievable dearth of value in most group, group projects according to the student perspective. However, when, it, when asked more fully about the nature of group collaboration, the majority of the students believe that that group collaboration is important and they all want more interaction with their peers as part of the learning. So clearly the, the conclusion that I'm drawing is that we're just not doing it very well. That we're not scoping group projects, that we're not enabling group communication, that we're not uh, uh, having it be significant or meaningful enough for them to participate in it fully or to, to care about it in the way they would care about, uh, like being part of Lindy's class, for example, Lindy in a, a genius class. So, uh, and uh, that led me to some more research about this. Um, and it turns out there's some common themes across all different levels of education in different formats. So the, the table you're seeing on the right is uh, pulled from a study in the um, Journal of Education and Human Development that was based on coded comments from online education uh, student course evaluations. 
So you can see everything you would expect to see there, including the very, uh, think, uh, so helpfully specific dislike group work. Um, but the things that, have, that I've identified from common themes from a literature review and from my own experience are accountability, that students hate uh, classically, stereotypically, being the one person who does the, all the work or the people who skive off and don't do anything, uh, that there's not enough guidance from the instructor in most situations, that the instructor isn't present enough in the group project for it to be meaningful. And in many cases, students feel like the, the, the instructor is offloading the, the teaching of the class to the group. Uh, and I think that's, that is, um, there's something understandable psychologically about that if there's not enough instructor engagement and if the group project isn't meaningful in advancing learning outcomes for the class. Schedule, particularly for online classes, how do you get time to work with your, with your peers? How do you make sure they're prioritizing that? How is that set up front? And then finally, and this is uh, an area that is, uh, I think, under acknowledged by most faculty, is the significance of the group work impact on the grade. Not the project impact on the grade, but that the group work and the quality of work put into the project has an impact on that grade and the learning, uh, which, of course, those two should be tied together. So the, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. I'm not going to be able to talk about all of it today. I've been I'm sort of working on a book about this loosely. There's tons and stu tons of stuff out there. Um, other factors we can consider group assignment and composition. How do you put groups together? Where do you allow the students to form peer connections versus random assignment? How are you thinking about inclusivity in terms of a diver uh, and diversity in terms of your group composition so that you don't have monolithic thinking in your uh, group comp uh, your from your group output? Um, the, uh, and I won't talk through all these here. The one at the bottom that's grayed out obviously is not going to apply in an online environment so much. We have that kind of as an uber uh, uh, circumstance for all online teaching. The ones that are bolded we'll touch on, but just so you know, there's lots of stuff that goes into a good group collaboration structure that goes beyond the contracts and the assessments, but that's the, I have been found the two things that are relatively simple to implement but that have the biggest impact on, on the learning effectiveness in group collaboration, especially in an online environment where the students don't have social accountability in terms of their ability to talk to each other and the fact that they've started to form friendships and relationships in a really significant way and therefore have the peer pressure to, to follow through. Um, so starting with contracts, these contracts, there's more to think through here than you would necessarily think. And also I want to note, uh, you could also call them charters or there's other, other terminology that um, you could use here. I prefer contracts because I come from a arts and entertainment background myself. So uh, contracts are generally like you are part of what you, how you participate in a creative group. You, you're going to be responsible for this part of this thing that's just going to take hundreds of people to do. Contracts should be student led and that their terms should be as much as possible defined by the, the students. Sometimes this is going to be more possible and sometimes less possible. So if you're not like I am teaching in a in a class where the, the point is the collaboration and you have very specific learning outcomes that you need this, each student to come away with, you're not going to be able to have a situation where one student does the research and one student uh, assembles the presentation and the other student develops the presentation and leads the reflection because you need everybody to be engaged in the research. Um, so that may be able to be defined uh, up front to some degree by the by the instructor and therefore left a little bit of a multiple choice, like everybody selects some of the tasks from the list. Um, but the, I found the more effective uh, contracts are those where the students can identify what areas they're interested in and what areas align with their own skills that they either feel confident in or they feel they need to improve. Uh, they should be descriptive, not just of the responsibilities of each individual member, but also of the group's idea, because this, the, in that sense, the contract also serves as a consensus acknowledgement of what the group intends to do and their expectations for how to complete it. It should be scaled appropriately to the scope of the project. Don't have your students spend hours on a contract if it's only going to be for a two-week project, and therefore it's just not worth the time and effort. Uh, specific about responsibilities, specific, uh, including not just I'm going to complete this component of the project, but I'm going to deliver it in this format and in this time and notify you at this point. Like that is as much as possible. Those specifics are really important. Contracts should be public. Uh, visible to all so that somebody else can go back and look at it so they, they can all look at it together and see this is what I'm responsible for. Obviously, dates are included. It wants to be normed to align with the stated values of both the class and the group. So uh, I always, I spend time in every class I teach, whether it's about collaboration or not, establishing group behaviors, norms, and values. And what are the things we're going to accept in terms of the way we interact with each other, the way we ask questions. 
Uh, but the, each of the groups, if, particularly if it's a longer term project, should spend some time doing that internally. And then finally, this should be signed. And, and frankly, I, I have found that there is a little bit of a psychological effect in them actually being a physical signature, as opposed to I click a button on a Google form to acknowledge that I've read the terms and have agreed to them. So just to look back at that in terms of a single page, here's what my basic template for a contract is. Um, it, it includes the project description from the instructor so that they are, know what they're agreeing to in terms of that component. And it also serves as a little bit of an acknowledgement of that component of the syllabus. It describes the idea, it includes the protocols, norms, and values, and it gives their contact information, and this is internal to the group, so that they know if I have been reaching out to a person, they have been responding, but I haven't been using the email address they gave me, then there's some, he said, she said about whether or not that person's fulfilling their responsibilities. Like so we know that how they're supposed to be contacted and what their, their limitations are. Uh, member responsibilities and the signatures, as I've said before, in terms of peer assessments, uh, another set of characteristics that are really important, obviously anonymous. We don't want, uh, I think there's, a, there's another process I use for peer feedback in class when that's possible or synchronously uh, online called the critical response process, which was developed by Liz Lerman, um, who's an incredible dancer and artist who's developed this process for giving feedback. And that can't be, isn't anonymous, shouldn't be anonymous and, and is led and facilitated in a way that keeps those um, conversations constructive, civil, and useful, um, but in the online format, uh, anonymity is really important for students to feel heard, um, impactful, and that the peer, not, not just that the project grade shows up in the grade in a meaningful, the final grade in the class in a meaningful way, but that the peer evaluations are a known percentage of the final grade on either the project or in the class. So that the students know that they are having a direct and non-instructor mediated uh, impact on, on their grades. That is maybe the single most important factor in accountability for um, getting students to, to all be on the same page. Uh, reflective of both the contract, obviously, and also the course learning outcomes. Uh, mutual to in include evaluation of self and peers. So mostly what I do when I implement this is I actually have the, uh, the final grade and the peer evaluation component of each project be done as a mean of the student's evaluation of themselves and then the evaluation of their, that the peers give them on that, um, on all the categories. So, and, and actually I find I'm still tweaking that formula because I find that really good students tend to peer about, tend to have uh, really um, uh, maybe conservative or modest evaluations of themselves and really uh, um, perhaps generous uh, evaluations of their peers and not so good students flip that around. So still trying to balance that um, and I, and I have to tweak that basically every time I, I teach a class. Uh, aggregated in terms of uh, don't present it as respondent one said this, respondent two said this, just say respondent said, that aids in an anonymity and helps present a picture of consensus. Uh, there's always, I, I always include a place for um, uh, respondents to allow comments to be seen just by the instructor and then other comments that will be seen by the user or the participant. And then finally, that the assessments, and I'm going to get into this more in just a second, don't just talk about whether or not they delivered on the work product, but also talk about the student's behavior in the collaboration. This is critically important in courses like mine where I'm evaluating them on their collaborative practice as much or more than the quality of whatever the final product is. But it is also, I think, important to the overall group performance, uh, and it just, regardless of what subject you teach in. So on that note, two, I'm gonna, I have two sample sections of rubrics here that I use, one that's focused on behavior and practice and the other which is focused on deliverables. Uh, this is part of a larger assessment that I use in my courses uh, called the Peer Collaborative Assessment, which has 15 different categories or 15 different sublines, each like refinement here that are all evaluated separately and include both this Likert scale and the place for open comment, uh, one to the instructor and one to the participant. Um, so I won't read through this, but you can see uh, the one thing that I note here in terms of rubric construction is I, I present pretty standard options on one through four uh, in terms of the, the meets and exceeds fall far below. Um, and I always try to put something aspirational in the greatly exceeds um, because I put that out to the, like the rubrics are published as part of the project description. So they know what they're gonna be evaluated on the end. Having something aspirational is uh, that has a, a little bit more poetic and paints a picture of a person who is a, a, a truly wonderful collaborator um, has shown them actually significant improvement in the way that students perform. They know what they're shooting for. They've given them an aspirational goal to reach for as opposed to just where am I going to fall on this scale. 
on the deliverable side, there's only a, there's, this is customized to what the individual work product is and whatever project and whatever class. Um, but there's usually a couple of these, just a, like two or three lines having to do with if the student met their deadlines, if they fulfilled their project uh, requirements. Um, and I won't read through all this, but you can see that basically it's, it starts with above and beyond. Truly the, the person you want to work with, the person you want to keep coming back to again and again, the lifelong collaborators that you'll, that especially in the arts and entertainment are such incredible uh, resources to the, the whole reason to go to college if you're in the arts and entertainment, frankly, is to build a network of um, collaborators that you're going to spend the rest of your life working with uh, because it's not like we require degrees for these professions. Um, so the, the rest of these objects are, you know, just about fulfilling responsibilities, but this one is the one we're really shooting for, the five. And then uh, just to come close to a wrap up here, um, a couple different timelines. I've got a short term and a long term project. So uh, my classes tend to build several different projects in parallel. I'll usually start off with a short term, but actually also start off a long term project at the same time, because I think it's a valuable skill to have students have to work with more than one group in parallel. Um, so that they're balancing different lines of inquiry, different lines of creativity. And they're they, actually, I think being parts of multiple groups helps um, them understand the, the scope of perspective on the class better than being just a part of an insular single group does. Uh, but if you're using just one of these, um, then these, I think these apply. So uh, this is pretty self-explanatory, but I, one thing is to be important is that contracts don't start until the group, the scope of the project and the, the, the extent of the idea is understood. The contracts come partway through the process. There's always needs to be a milestone and instructor check-in, even in very short projects where the group is meeting or, or having, um, giving a report of some kind to the instructor, the instructor is responding to that report or those, uh, uh, those, uh, that feedback so that they, this, the group knows the instructor is committed and interested and invested in the project. And then finally, the, the last peer assessments happen only at the end. This is fairly straightforward. It keeps from spending too much time on these processes in a class, which unlike mine is, is not about uh, collaboration as an end goal. Um, and I think this is simple to implement. If you're working on a truly exploration learning or project-based learning course, which uh, needs to have an overarching scope of project that carries through the entire semester or course, um, this is more, in my opinion, um, uh, really what we should be shooting for in terms of actually understanding student participation in these types of formats. So spending time on project scoping early, giving that some time to rest, doing the ideation, the brainstorming, setting the norms and values, letting them build relationships, Drafting the contract, giving time for a review of that so that they know what they're committing to, they've thought through it, finalizing them about a quarter of the way through the process, uh, and then having several different periods during spread throughout where they do, there's actually spaces at which they can do contract adjustments because good creativity and good inquiry always has evolution along the way. They always need to be able to account for and respond to flexibly to developments that nobody anticipated in the beginning. So, and we need to be acknowledged that the, the deliverables are gonna change and the, and the responsibilities are gonna change as people discover more about each other's capacity and as they understand the scope of the project better. Uh, and then also I always do on a longer term project, I do peer assessments at two points uh, and at the midpoint and then also at the end. And those have slightly different characters. And this, the, the, the midpoint is mostly about process and behavior. How are they, uh, how are people being, are they being inclusive? Are they energetic? Are they responsible? Are they punctual? Um, and then the final one, it, it tends to be a little bit more about the product and about reflection for improving their own practice and their peers' practice as they move forward. So the, 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 the character changes very slightly in that. If they've had a chance to respond in process, then at the end it becomes reflection and it becomes a chance for them to tell their peers, if you're going to go forward, here are some things I would suggest you doing in your next group, in the next time you have this experience, which actually tends to be the most helpful feedback that any student gives in these evaluations, because it's no longer about me and the thing that I did. It's, it's the, the sense of altruism and helping somebody grow. And the great thing about that is, is it makes them much more um, uh, even handed. It makes them much more insightful about the, the rest of the judgment they're giving because it's separating them out from the bitterness or the resentment or the, or the, the excitement even um, that they had during this process and getting them to think metacognitively about how they're going to transfer that to the next thing they do and how they can use it in other settings. Um, all right, this is the last slide. Um, so we actually will have some good time for discussion here. 
So these are other just really important things that didn't happen to fit into any specific um, elements earlier on. I always start out my classes that are going to use group projects, whether they're specifically about group collaboration or not, um, by doing what I call a quick fire challenge. For those of you who used to watch Top Chef, where I do a project in miniature during a single day, um, whether that's synchronously with a class that's meeting in person, or whether I'm giving them a limited period, like a 24 or 48 hour period, depending on how the class is broken down, to go through a project in full. Now, those projects obviously aren't, they can't be open ideation, they can't have an open scope, they have to be basically trying to solve a, a small puzzle or, or um, it's the, uh, it is the, this version of the doing the egg drop in the physics class in, in uh, high school, right? Like it's a very small problem to solve in which they each commit very quickly to the thing that they're going to attempt to do. They do it and then they reflect on it because it gets them used to the norms and values. It gets them used to thinking about that evaluation process as being meaningful. And then it also has them engage with each other in a way that is lighthearted and fun and starts to build a group relationship before they suddenly have this big weight to sit on them about expectations that they have to fulfill for the class. I did note before, but I wanted to reinforce contracts should be able to be modified. And in fact, in some of my classes, this is too complex for um, many courses that have very large enrollments and have very, very specific standards. But I actually allow groups to revise contracts at any time, but through conversation with the instructor, and the instructor has to sign off on modifications halfway through. So there's not, it doesn't have to be milestones. It can just be um, a, an open process. But um, that sometimes that's, that requires too much instructor attention. Uh, options for teams to establish group identity are incredible. So uh, if you, the, I, I encourage them to name their teams. I encourage them to um, uh, think about things they could do together, ways they could interact that are beyond the scope of the project because they're clearly going to improve um, the group collaboration when they aren't always task focused. One of the other things I do um, for classes that have any sort of synchronicity, even if they're being required to meet on their own and we're not meeting as a full class, is I give them a little tiny challenges they have to take on, just you know, brain teasers or little challenges they have to take on at, every week. So they have something they can feel successful about, like they can they can fix it. It's an easy thing. It, it, it tends to relieve some of the pressure that uh, builds up over time in group projects where it's all feeling like it's um, too big and too cloudy and too far away and there's too many pieces left to go. If you can give each group just a moment to be successful at something and be excited, maybe laugh, that can greatly improve group collaboration. And then the most successful group work I've ever seen done is in classes where I was able to pull in peer mentors, either from upper division versions of that same class or being come in as student volunteers or even paid student workers. This is not an option for most people, but if you can structure a sequence of classes so that uh, like later sequence classes have a component of their learning where they're teaching or leading collaboration at lower division courses is transformative. They've been through the process. They can, they can help reinforce the things they, you, you've taught, the things you've learned. Uh, they are respected, um, uh, particularly among kind of more traditional college students. This is more common in the in-person on-campus students than the online because the online students are so diverse in terms of their demographics and their ages. But for a 19-year-old to see a 22-year-old come in and say, these are the things that I learned in this class and this is why it's important, absolutely transformative. I and mean, they're still at that point in their uh, adolescence, post-adolescence, where that peer input is far more important than anything instructors ever going to say. So if that's a possibility for you to, to build in, in anywhere from middle school all the way up to undergraduate, that's an incredibly transformative um, uh, uh, component of what, that you can in, include in group collaboration or uh, inquiry or exploration-based classes. But I think that uh, will do it for me, but I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. So if you uh, have, a, don't, we don't get to, to questions or comments in the chat today, I am super thrilled to ever have, to have a conversation with anyone about this at any level. And I've taught this stuff not just in uh, undergrad and graduate students, but I've consulted and worked with um, uh, teachers and uh, project-based learning classrooms at K through six and, uh, and high school levels. So uh, there's lots of different um, ways to take this and I'm, I'm always happy to have those conversations. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, your, your talk inspired lots of chat here. Um, and there's a question from Steve Battelle. Hi, Steve. Um, I'm going to read it out for you because in case you, so you don't have to scroll all the way. This is a great presentation. My one concern with any contract is that students will tend to pick the things they prefer to do. 
How do you get a student to take on something that they are reticent to do? It seems that that is where the real thing, real learning begins. Yeah, and, and, and I absolutely agree that that's something the instructor may need to weigh in on depending on the learning outcomes of the class and how they relate to the responsibilities as you break them down. In my opinion, uh, the, the best scenario is allow students to gain confidence at certain levels and then to explore also uh, uh, either in sequence or in parallel. So uh, mostly what I do with my classes I'm, is I give students the option um, both, of group, both for how the groups are composed and the responsibilities they can have for a short uh, project that's early in the class and then I ask then I then I assign them to a different group based on a dif differentiated set of skills and interests so I am manually building groups based on first project performance that then are that are giving students the um, a distribution which is going to force them to explore areas they haven't uh, explored before and then also explore relationships with students they haven't met so that's a complicated and time intensive process the other way to break it down though, particularly for teaching in subject matter where you have specific learning outcomes that each student needs to walk away with regardless of their group participation, is to make the, the list of responsibilities available to the students as a list and then make sure that only like uh, students can have to pull one from group A, one from group B, one from group C. So they have to contribute meaningfully to research, they have to contribute meaningfully to authorship, and they have to contribute meaningfully to, to presentation. So like, they have to choose one from each. You don't have to let them just choose whatever they, they, they want. But I think if you can do that early on in any learning process, it's really great because students, I think before they feel confident enough to, to participate in groups meaningfully and equitably, they have to feel confident in what they can contribute. That's the, one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks for students is that they don't feel confident enough to speak up and that'll cause them to disassociate and, and, and drop out of the process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see, there, there's, <laughs> if you want to put another question into the Q&A, that's good. In the meantime, I will, um, would love to, let's see, just trying to keep it all in, in the right order. Um, Park, well, I did respond to your question, Lindy. Um, if you saw that, um, about the, what's, because you made such an interesting comment, Jake, about the real purpose of why people go to university in, in your particular field. And it made, of course, all of us wonder, well, why do we go to our, what are we supposed to get from <laughs> our field? So then there was a whole conversation. You'll have to catch up on that. Let's see, John uh, Harrison, one of our panelists asks, do you have a method to do these contracts and peer assessments within Canvas groups? Not a great one. I kind of have to engineer them. So I usually do the peer assessment through Google Forms because it's just easier for me to build fields and insert images of the rubric, et cetera. Um, than it is to do in a Canvas quiz or test. I, uh, and then on the contracts, they, they have a template they work from in Canvas that's in the, in the form of an assignment, but it's, it's always then has to be circulated as a document. I uh, would love if someone like Beagle would build this as a tool specifically for this type of process because it would be hugely helpful uh, in cutting down the instructor prep and response time. Let's, let's talk about that. I want to understand what this would look like and, and figure out if it's possible because it, it could be that it's a great fit for the kind of thing we want to try to help with. Okay. Um, I have a question for you and I'm sorry if I missed it early on in your talk, but did you talk about group leads? Who are the leaders of these groups and how are they picked or are there no leaders? Yeah, so I didn't get into that and that's a whole nother area of, of interest for me is the, the nature of group decision making, consensus building and leadership. Um, and I have a, a two week section of the class that I teach for freshmen on that whole process. Like, how do you go through the process of decision making? I give them four or five different methods of voting. Um, we give them three or four different methods of uh, including, uh, I saw in the comment earlier about Quaker practice, Quaker, the Quaker practice for consensus building and um, is uh, a really incredible model. But I also tell them one of the ways that we can do is you can you can establish a leader. You can like this is something that I think is not acknowledged enough in group projects as sort of badly defined by the larger scope of public education is that we don't acknowledge that there is, there can be a leader. That that's a thing that can happen. Um, the 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 issue that we have to do is norm behaviors for for leaders so that they know 
how to make response, uh, when to when to insert themselves into a conversation, when to have when like when to move the group forward versus let it continue discourse. How do you have a leader that jumps in and knows when to make the decision as opposed to letting the decision emerge from the group? How do you have a leader that knows when they have to be following up with a group member who's not contributing versus just letting that that person uh, have the pressure of the project? Like that's those are all separate subjects. And um, generally speaking, I try to keep groups for their first experience, not formally establishing a leader. I mean, some are going to emerge. But trying to explore group consensus making practices that are not about having a single person be the shot caller and that because I think that's going to help them um, feel more confident in their contributions and have the, the group seem more equitable. And I have to say also, if I don't do that, if I don't intentionally build those practices with people, I tend to see way too high a percentage of leaders that are emerging are white men. I mean, that's just because they insert themselves and in, in, in other students in the group back off of their desire to be a leader. Maybe they haven't developed the confidence or maybe they just don't want to deal with that guy. So it's uh, if they can spend some time first building consensus making processes and then they can say, OK, well, this actually makes sense. This guy is way more experienced, like he's a 45 year old Air Force colonel or something uh, and like lots of experience managing group project I, like that makes natural sense. But I think they have to try first to see where those uh, where those attributes come from and how they can be substituted for. Can I just insert a little comment about the leadership that we do with our working groups, something Evgenia and I've worked on a lot in mm -hmm. Turner. Um, we have a role for the leader of the working group um, uh, where they, their job is not to be the main speaker or the main thought provoker in any way, but to make sure that every voice gets equal time because every single person has to report out on the things they've learned so everyone can hear and that everyone needs to get the peer collaboration on their natural next question. And so yeah. um, we have this kind of subversive goal that if that is, if the leader changes every single week, then people get in the habit of seeing every person as a potential leader and they get in the habit of realizing that every voice has to be heard in every meeting. And so it's a little bit of a subversive social engineering experiment that we're yeah. doing. <laughs> I think that's incredible from a symbolic standpoint. I may, it may change me to change, may cause me to change my terminology about this, but one thing the similar function that I use in the, uh, the projects early on and then, and then also at the end when we're in ideation and then in reflection is we appoint one group member and then it rotates to do to be what we call a facilitator. So they're doing the same. They're they're driving the conversation, but they're stepping back from their own contributions. And I have to say, in certain cases, what I use that for is to get people who are over contributors to back off. I appoint them the facilitator. Oh, you cut out. We, we've lost Jay. Uh, but I think it's uh, yeah, sorry, I got a phone call and it cut off my audio. Um, I think the, the, that that idea of a facilitator is critical, and, but I think that you make a good point um, symbolically about the leader, like getting that chance to act as a facilitator. If we, we, if we name it a leader, then they had to start to see themselves in those roles more often, which would be cool. I think I, I just learned so much from your talk too. I kind of feel like it's just like learning from you guys. I'm really excited. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I was thinking, Lindy, about this, about how Jake had do, does a, um, a miniature version of a, of a group project, right? You talked about that, Jake. Um, the quick fire. It could be, it could be a fun beginning class for us to do a whole inquiry cycle in one class. That As, would be great. To give like them a practice give, one. Like a yeah. practice one to give them a sense of what's really happening so it's less mysterious. Anyway, I made a note. Thank you, Jake, for that. It also makes for a great fun first or second day of class, like because you can give prizes and and do all sorts of stuff with it. Like it just makes for like if you get them laughing and uh, being lighthearted about it, even though if there's there should still be serious learning content. Um, it's it it sets the tone for the entire semester in a way that I think is hard to substitute for. I love the idea of prizes and in our when we moved all online, we gave people titles instead. So we had like the jumping jack czar and this kind of thing um, that that just felt like little prizes and made different people special each time. We also had the plus ones, which I thought was great. Do you know what I mean by that, Jake? For everyone? Where, I know, don't know. So where students had um, an opportunity to privately give a plus one to another student in the class and they could say you know I really appreciated when you spoke up on this issue um, and that person would just get like a little private note of you know nice work really appreciated you in the class um, or cool. something like that and I think they I think that made them gel as a group better and that was really nice um, are there any more questions awesome. from our attendees for Jake or anyone else 
You do have an invitation to speak in Michigan, Jake, from Steve Patel. I saw that. I'll have to, to follow up on that. Um, I do have, I've, I've wrote a whole list of questions for you, Jake. I'm just trying to give other people a chance, but. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> but um, if no one sees any other questions, I'll ask my, my last one for you. And that is about the anonymity of your feedback. So you say that they give feedback anonymously. Why not give feedback not anonymously? So I struggle with this. I actually struggle with this pretty, uh, pretty frequently when it comes, when the anonymous, when I don't have time for more than one channel for feedback. So my, my preference is particularly for a long-term group project is to do an in-person reflection period where we do, we actually run it using the critical response process where it's not anonymous, where there's a chance for open conversation. And, then, and, and I usually do that before the formal online peer assessment protocol. So they have a chance to talk. They, they specifically have a chance to hear each other's perspectives. And they have a chance to figure out how they would couch it in a way that would make it useful to the other person when it's not an anonymous cycle. It makes the, it makes the feedback I get then in the assessment because they feel like they have to be in line with what they said. It, it, it feels like it's much more insightful. It's much more gentle. It's much more useful. The comments tend to be more one. There tend to be more open comments, like more substantial ones, but they also tend to be more uh, phrased in a way the other person can hear because they've heard the other person speak uh, and they know what to think about. Like they, they know what their perspective on the situation is. Um, but I found when I, when the, the comments were not uh, anonymous in the online format and there was an online format only when I tried that, the problem is, is that because I use it generally at the end of a project and then they're not going to work together again with that same group, that, that they, they tended to be dismissive. Like they weren't investing in the project, project process enough because it wasn't something they knew they were going to take forward into the next project. If you were going to use, if you're going to have the same group for multiple projects in, se in sequence, or if they knew they were in a major where they had to work on these, they were going to be with these same people next semester, the semester after, the semester after that, then I think you could probably do that and it would take some re-engineering, but it just didn't work for, for me in the format that I had it, um, what the last, uh, the last class I had this in. Okay. Well, thank you everyone, all the attendees and especially also all the panelists for sharing and teaching. Um, I know I learned a lot and hopefully all of you did also. And um, our fabulous um, organizer, Taryn Strzok, is going to put the recording of this all online, um, including, some, um, including some resources that the speakers um, will provide. And if you have any more questions and you want to just keep the dialogue going, maybe shoot me an email. My email address is here, skolnik at asu.edu. Um, and you can visit Interplanetary and read more about Interplanetary Initiative at ASU. And just want to say thank you so much, everyone. I really, really appreciated it. And it's so timely and so important. And I think we should take away a message that we heard a couple of times from Lindy and from Jenny on uh, one of the attendees that this is an opportunity, that we have to take this as an opportunity to better education for everyone. Um, and I think we can do it. It's going to be great. Big, big thanks to Evgenia and Taryn for making this all happen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, it was great to see you all. All right. Okay.